Hello and welcome to the Airgun World podcast, brought to you in association with Crackshot, the Southwest's premier airgun centre and ranges. I'm Matt Manning. With me this evening, I've got my good mate, Rich Saunders, also an Airgun World magazine contributor. Hiya, Rich. Uh, and Morning. with us, our guest this evening, I'm really pleased to welcome John Hatton from BSA Guns. Hiya, John. Hi there. Now, Hi, Matt. Hi, Rich. Now, we, we usually kick off by having a bit of a chat about what we've been doing shooting-wise in the past week or so. Uh, to be fair, mine's been much of a muchness. I do a lot of grey squirrel control. That's been that's been continuing over the past couple of weeks. I've done a little bit of Corvid decoying as well. In fact, I write about both of those shooting scenarios in the latest issue of Airgun World magazine, which looks like that and is out now. Shameless plug. My rat shooting this this winter. It, well, it's, it's kind of wrapping up now as we're, we're sort of getting deeper into spring, so that's slowing down. But in all honesty. None of my ratting permissions were particularly overrun this winter. It never really got going. So I'm going to hand over now to Rich, who I think we're going to have a regular section in the show where Rich gets a few minutes to make us all really jealous with his permissions. Rich, tell us about your recent rat shooting trip. So I, I played darts for the village pub darts team, and we had a couple of new guys joined um, a few months back who just happened to be gamekeepers. You know, perfect timing. And um, they're gamekeepers on a, on a large estate down in Hampshire. And they said, Rich, you've got to come out and shoot some rats. We shoot hundreds and hundreds of rats. So I went out uh, last week. Um, they've just cut three cover crops and had a load of waste maize um, on the ground. And they said, oh, you know, we shoot hundreds and hundreds and blah, blah, blah. And I kind of took all that with a big bag of salt. And Oh my God, I got down there, Matt, and it was like a scene from a horror film. I've never seen so many rats in all my life. We drove past a couple of fields, and my eyes were popping out of my head looking through the thermal. And they said, Oh, there's not many there. We'll go on to the next one. And we just kept going. And the further we went, the more rats there were. Um, so there's three of us shooting, <clears throat> um, just walking up a, up a hedgerow um, you know, in different locations. And by 3.30 in the morning, when we called it, a, called it a day or a night, we'd shot over 900 rats. And we know that because we all had uh, Dorman's clickers to keep a tally of, of, of what we were shooting. And the conditions were perfect. It was still very dark. Wind was in the right direction, you know, what there was. Um, and, yeah, I would make my way up a, up a hedgerow, shooting rats as I went. And when I stopped and turned around again, they'd all come out behind me again, you know, 12, 15 yards away. It was just unreal. It really was. I mean, and you know, I can't wait to go back again. To be honest, yeah, nine hundred rats that, and about that. That five, is incredible. Hours. So, when you're shooting that number of rats, like I've just said, the ratting on my farm's been my, my farm permissions. It's been pretty modest, to put it mildly, this winter. So, it's been a lot of bait and wait, put down mm. bait spots, target areas that are a little bit busier than others, wait for the rats to come out, pick them off from a static position. Obviously, you're not messing about like that on a session session like the one you've had no it, it's it's one of the few times where i've had to I, I was out with my i was using a, a brk ghost the small one so not the biggest air capacity but you know i don't know 200 shots or something to a fill and i was it's the first time i've had to fill the tank up twice um you know and crack open a new a new tin of pellets um yeah just literally you know they they, they were so intent on on getting the the last of the maze on the field and they're sort of digging into the field and everything that they were largely you know and i could shoot three or four in a group of five or six before the other two cleared off yeah <laughs> just incredible i mean I, i'm sure well the guy said that they've had two or three nights like that um and i'm sure that once the maze is gone then the rats will disappear again but yeah for the moment yeah and they they, they say they've shot nearly four thousand um this year already so, yeah, and I can believe it. I, you know, having seen it with my own eyes, I could, yeah, it wasn't, uh, they weren't telling tall stories. I'm very, very jealous, and I will bend your arm to come out and join you there at some point, maybe next yeah. winter. John, do, are you a shooter, and do you get the opportunity, if so, to do much shooting? Because I know certainly the past couple of weeks, months, you've been all over the place with, with shows and foreign travel. 
Yeah, uh, in answer to that, I am a shooter and have been since um, my early years, um, where I used to do a little bit of bunny dropping, a bit of pest control in the fields quite close to where I live. Um, I'm fortunate enough that I, I still live quite close to that location and do have occasionally permissions that I can go on. Um, however, due to travels, work, and when you're immersed in um, guns, uh, nine to five, and in fact, it, out of those hours as well. Um, often, you know, any little bit of downtime gets consumed by family and other things, but I do try to as much as I can. Um, it, ironically, I'm at the Clayground this Saturday coming, and then I've got um, a, a permission to um, clear some rabbit, shall we say, from uh, three private football pitches that are all on a bit of private land that's enclosed mm -hmm. and uh, locked away from the public. Um, and last year, about two years ago, um, the, the, the bunny population completely dried up um, where it was uh, very busy, I'd say, three years ago. Mm -hmm. And then um, it, it went really quiet last year, so I kind of left it alone. And uh, I took a call only this week to say, can you come back? They're all back again. So uh, I'm hoping that the weather will be warm enough to bring them out the burrows and uh, that, uh, that over the weekend I can do a bit of, a bit of sport there, a bit of pest control. So br bringing it back to, to BSA Guns, John. I mean, it, it's it's a brand that will chime with with most shooters. You know, most of us are well aware of it. It's got a really rich heritage. Can you give us a bit of a, a potted history on on BSA guns? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've been uh, around a long time um, uh, as a collective prior to the company actually setting up in 1861. So it'll be a bit of a crunch version this one, but. Um, I'll, I'll give that quite a, a quick summary if I can. But um, basically, uh, going back to the court of William and Mary, um, the king overheard a conversation. Basically, there was a, a Birmingham MP called Richard Newdigate that overheard the king expressing his displeasure at buying snap hands muskets from the Dutch for the British Army. <laughs> and basically, the MP from Birmingham said, hold on a minute, I know some lads in Brum that can make some good guns. Can you give them a trial? Which they duly did. Um, they had a trial order for 100 uh, muskets, which they supplied. And um, th that little collective of Birmingham gun makers continued to supply the British Army for a while until they became so successful that um, they decided to pull the company in together and have one business name, which in 1861 became the Birmingham Small Arms Company. Um, since that time, obviously, a lot of the production in World War One and Two. Um, was for the, the British and Allied forces, building many, many different guns, mines, rockets, fuses, bicycles, the folding paratroopers' bike, um, even a car at one point, um, to the extent that um, BSA bought the Daimler Motor Company. They also owned Norton motorbikes at one time. Hmm. Um, so it, it's been... Um, uh, a real busy time for them. And basically, they were a self-sufficient company um, and wanted to be. So where we're on Armoury Road in Small Heath, Birmingham, we run parallel to one side of the factory is the, the railway line. And the other side is the canal, which were obviously the motorways of the time when they set mm -hmm. up. And they decided to make their own steel in Sheffield. And if you or anybody listening owned a spring company or a, a wheel company or a cog company, they'd buy your company, put you in charge as Mr. Director, but call it BSA Springs or Cogs or Wheels. And um, that was basically um, where we came from. Um, we diversified into air guns um, from the Lincoln Jeffries models, which was BSA produced according to somebody else's pattern um, around the turn of the last century. And then BSA started doing their own. Um, I'm not too sure actually what year that was, but we've, you know, been producing under the BSA brand for, you know, over a hundred years, certainly. So, um, and then that leads us into present day where the, the concentration is, 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 uh, entirely on air guns. Um, still some traditional brake barrel production, but predominantly on PCP. John. I, when I hear 
BSA, you know, the, the thing that always springs to my mind synonymous with you is the cold hammer forge barrel. Yeah. And I know it's a very, very good thing. Other than the obvious, I don't really know how it's made. Can you kind of explain to me, other than it's hammered and it's cold, how, how, <laughs> a, how a cold hammer forged barrel is made, and also what makes it better than any other manufacturing process? Okay. I mean, the, the, basically 35,000 hammer blows achieve the, um, the, the end product of our barrels. Wow. And um, the, the hammer blows are, 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 if you can imagine like a large lathe, I mean, I, I'm, I'm talking non-technically here because I think it, 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 it may best describe to the majority of people. It's quite a long and quite an old machine, but um, a, a mandrel, if you think of almost a, a thin biro uh, centre going through a pre-drilled metal barrel. So the, it's pre-drilled. Mm -hmm. The mandrel goes through the middle, which actually has the rifling on it. And it goes inside and all around the barrel, the large hammers, which each hammer is like an anvil. You know, they're like a, a small anvil. They're, wow. they're, they're hit onto the uh, surface of the barrel um, as the barrel passes through the hammers. And what this actually does, it forms the external diameter and the internal rifling. Um, and also one of the final processes, it also um, puts a true crown on the end of the barrel, um, which gives it, we believe, supreme accuracy, um, more than many barrels that are available in today's market do. But that's basically the, the forging process. That's not the total process, and we haven't discussed finishing or the, you know, yeah. the CNC um, uh, the drilling and machining that goes on to actually drill. Uh, holes and grooves that actually accept the action and uh, you know enable it to be put onto a finished gun and, but, and i guess um, because it's a a cold process and the metal isn't heated up no not at all yeah and the, it, you're, it's not cold. The, you're not affecting the, the metallurgy you know you're not changing the the, the substance of the metal at all you, you're not, not but the hammered forging process does actually increase the um it improves the structure, the grain structure mm -hmm. of the, the steel. It actually makes it stronger and tougher. Wow. Well, it certainly yeah. works. And, and cold hammer forged barrels forever on BSA rifles, or is that a, an evolution? Or is that no, how they've it, always been it's, done? It's, it's actually the cold hammer forger was there from, uh, when, from the production of the bullet guns. So we've oh. been making gun barrels on that. I always think it's quite a nice thing to have, particularly for an air gunner um, who um, in many cases hasn't got a firearm and doesn't necessarily mm. need one, but he, he, he quite likes to feel that he's shooting one. And I think it's always quite a nice uh, thing to say that, you know, it's made on the same, mm. in the same process, the same machine as the yeah. bullet manufacturing was done on BSA barrels for the last 40, 50 years or more. Well, while I'm grilling you on all things BSA production, John, so, um, yeah, I'm a big BSA fan. I've got several Springers and PCP guns. Um, it seems like you guys have kind of resisted the whole carbon fiber buddy bottle um, trend until very recently. Um, is there <coughs> any particular reason for that? And, and now I think we've got one model that's got a, a buddy bottle. Are we going to see more? Do you think a carbon body buddy bottle? Yeah, I, th I think you will. I think you will in time. I agree with you. It's definitely become um, a, a modern requirement and and trend for air guns. Um, I think you have to remember that as a manufacturer, whenever you um, buy component parts, and I include in that stocks and uh, bottles um, mm. uh, and, and and everything else that goes with them. You're, you're not buying them just for now or for the next two weeks production. Often you kind of sign up an agreement all in order to get the best quality and to ensure the best price for quite a long time into the future. Mm -hmm. So you might actually buy you, your stocks with say a year or even two years vision. It's exactly the same with the, with the bottles. And when it comes to ordering those, the quantities are high. 
much much higher than people would um, would believe. So, so in some cases, even though you want to bring in, say, a carbon fiber uh, bottle, you might have five thousand aluminium bottles that you've got to run through first. So, uh, it, it it's probably not an answer that. Um, it, Many will readily accept, but that is the truth. And we've got we've got so many carbon um, <laughs> aluminium bottles that simply we're not going to scrap them. Yeah. So it's a case of uh, bringing carbon in as and when we've decided to bring it in just now. Funnily enough, on the R12 CLX Pro on the t- on the top line, if you like, of the BSA uh, program, um, and they are available now, available to order. No, I mean, they're slightly more sense. expensive than aluminium. But um, equally, they tend to be slightly larger and give a higher shock capacity. So um, you'll see more of them. Put it that way, Richard. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, while, while we're on the subject of, of the R12 and your bottle guns, obviously that's BSA's flagship PCP. I've got an R10, which I've had for years. Absolutely love it. I've shot the R12 in most of its guises, and it's certainly a worthy successor. But I know. Mm. In its, in its early days, shortly after its launch, I think some of the, the keyboard warriors, and in fact, I looked at my notes just now and saw that I'd referred to them as keyboard warriors. Good job nobody else can see them. <laughs> um, and anyhow, I would have looked really stupid, wouldn't I? I? I know they were getting a little bit excited about references to early versions of the R12 suffering with, with jam-ups. Now, is there any truth in that? And, and if there was a problem, I assume it has now been remedied. Completely. Um, and quite a while ago now it was remedied. Initially, um, there were some teething problems and we, it caused a few jams. Um, and particularly it caused a few jams after, a, 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 I'd say, a couple of hundred shots were put through the gun. So anybody that had one with an issue would know about it. Um, and anyone that reported it at the time has been since dealt with. I think when on, on the back of COVID and quite a lot of our uh, trusted suppliers who were used to producing a certain amount of components per month to us uh, and and supplying those. On the back of COVID, where basically egg and world went berserk and a lot of people had got ready cash and started buying air guns um, and a lot of manufacturers, I imagine it would be the same for many, um, including ourselves, that had to uh, produce more guns and I think as a result of extra weight on suppliers to supply sooner and greater amount of parts there were some inconsistencies that normally aren't there or weren't there that became apparent it's actually forced us to in some cases reconsider some of the component suppliers help them improve in many cases and also, we've put some steps in our business that um, will, will prevent anything like that happening happening again. It wasn't many that it actually affected, but as you say, the keyboard warriors um, <laughs> caused quite alarm, and uh, as if it was a widespread problem, and it wasn't. You know, we see the stats of uh, guns that we produce, and we see the few that come back with an issue. And at the time, there were only a few, but they've since been dealt with. I mean, regardless of that, you dealt with it so comprehensively because I know, you know, we've had conversations about this in the past and it was it was a real kind of um, all hands to the pump to fix it. So good for you. Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, we strive for perfection, like every company out there, I imagine, all trying to do our very best and trying to improve every day that we come in and work. Um, and, you know, we don't always get it right. We, talk, we try to. Um, but we, we believe that, you know, th- that issue has made us stronger. It's made the product better. Mm. It's made our uh, uh, systems inside more robust. So hopefully we're in a good position to kick on. And the, the, the last year or so has been evidence that we have and will continue mm. to do so. And that, that R12 platform, you know, it, it's, it's seeing sort of numerous variants coming, coming onto, onto line, on, onto the market. And I saw at the British shooting show that the new takedown version was getting a lot of attention and, and it's unusual sort of stubby square shaped box or squarish box. Can you tell us a little bit yeah. more about this model and how it came to be? Yeah, yeah. It basically came about 
due to conversations that we had with uh, pest controllers and pest control firms um, that wanted something that was small and compact, yet really wanted the features um, and the, uh, of, of, of quite a large gun. And we were thinking, well, hold on a minute, this is a bit, this is a bit, um, you know, cross purpose here. So we, we thought, well, if the stock actually came off the the gun easily and fitted back without any hassle and in seconds, then we could actually put the gun in a smaller case. Um, so hence the, the, the takedown idea came and this quick release screw underneath that does enable you to, you know, assemble the gun. The scope stays in place. The gun, the gun's action fits so snugly in the stock that um, your, your zero positions held. There's no, there's no opportunity for it to move forward or backwards when putting the stock back on the gun. Mm. So um, we thought, why don't we do like a complete package and not just for the pest controllers because many people live in smaller houses, flats, apartments, what have you, who don't have a lot of space to store the gun. Um, there's also the fact of transportation to the range or wherever you may be shooting. Um, the, uh, the, the long cases don't tend to fit in many boots. You know, a lot of people put them on the back seat of the car or stand them upright with a seat belt around them, etc. So we thought, why don't we put them in a small compact case, have the foam insert fitted so it accepts the silencer and the, the scope action and, and any accessories that we put in there and even a tin of pellets. And uh, that's how the idea kind of evolved. And it seemed that everybody that came in and kind of saw the prototype thought, why didn't you think of this before? <laughs> it's um, it, it's a good idea. So, um, well, yeah, the, the, the case, Matt, in answer to your question, is more like um, a hammer drill case. And we've even resisted the temptation to put the BSA logo on there because we just thought, well, that gives the game away. If pest controller or somebody's walking through a, shopping centre or a public area and they don't want it to be known that there's a gun in there. That's another advantage, you know, the, the, the box, yes, it's it's easy to store in your house, it's easy to fit in your car, but there is that advantage of it not obviously being gun-shaped or mm. gun-proportioned, so it's quite a discreet means of transporting an, an air gun, isn't it? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Great, well, look, we'll, we'll move on to the section now where we, we tackle questions that we get from readers listeners, viewers, however you want to refer to them, everybody that's, that's, that's tuning in and taking an interest in what we're up to. Rich, do you want to kick us off with that one? Yeah, so this is a, a, a question that's been submitted anonymously, but it's, it's a good one, and it's something that I must admit I grapple with from time to time. Um, but the, the viewer asks, are FAC air guns worth the fuss, or is it better to go straight to bullet-firing rifles if you want more power than the sub-12? So I'm guessing like two two LR one seven HMR maybe. So I know you shoot FAC, Matt. So why don't you kick us off with that before I throw my pen at him? Yeah, I've I've probably got too much to say about this. I'll take ages. I'll be as quick as I can. First, my first point is if I could only have one air rifle, it would be sub twelve foot pounds. <laughs> you can use them in confined spaces. They're quiet. They're efficient uh, for discrete pest control. A sub-12 air gun, you just can't beat that for versatility. However, in my opinion, there are situations in which an FAC-rated air rifle can shine. I don't tend to usually push it much over 30 foot-pounds, and for me, that would be a 2.2 caliber air rifle running pretty standard weight ammo, 16, maybe going up to 18 grains. And the gain for me is it's a little bit better in the wind than sub-12. It makes your heart and lung shots more more dependable, cleaner, faster, so it opens up another kill zone. I tend to stick to headshots only with sub-12, and it just gives me that sort of 2-2 two -two wallet with what would be regarded as a 177 trajectory. I don't really stretch the range. Even with FAC, I rarely hunt live or shoot live quarry beyond 50 metres. More often than not, it's less than 30 metres and certainly less than 35. So when I'm making a video using an FAC air gun and people say this isn't relative to us, uh, relevant to us, we shoot sub-12. Actually, I'm using it exactly the same as I would a sub-12, but maybe it's a breezy day, so I'm just using it to iron that out. Or maybe it's going to be a tricky day and having 
that wider range of kill zones on offer is an advantage. But I don't tend to really, really push the power hard. I haven't really got to grips with slugs yet, so I'm not pushing the power that far. And in my view, once you really start to, to up the, the foot pounds, you know, really pushing the power up, you probably are best going over to a powder burning rifle because you're starting to lose all of the things that make air guns brilliant. Like I said, they're at sub 12 foot pounds and, and lower FAC levels, they're incredibly quiet. They've got no or virtually no discernible muzzle flip. Um, the, the risk of ricochet and carry is less than it is at extreme high power. But once you ramp it up, those problems increase. Muzzle flip, noise, carry, ricochet. Yeah. And once you sort of lose those advantages and you look at the price of a decent rimfire versus the money you have to spend on an air gun that can achieve that level of performance smoothly and consistently, you probably are better off with a powder burner. So I think, putting it as briefly as I can, that, that's my take on it. What, what do you reckon, Rich? I'm with you on most of that, Matt. I, I, I do shoot. Um, I've got uh, some thirty calibre um hundred foot pound rifles and I shoot two five at sort of sixty five, seventy foot uh foot pounds. And but e- even then, I mean you still the heavier the pellet and the thirty calibre is shooting like fifty grain pellets. And you have the extra power but you have the extra weight to add stability to the shot. So even then I'm I and I only use mine really for shooting uh shooting rabbits. Um, at sort of 60, 70 meters. Maybe I might go out a little bit more, sort of closer to 80 meters. Um, but again, you know, it's the wind value, you know, it's, it's the wind beating value um, that really helps. And also the fact that you're just throwing a, um, a, a really heavy you know, air gun pellet at you know, near enough 900, 950 feet per second. Um, and a lot of people say to me, you know, you should be using 22LR and, or 17 HMR. And, and, Yes, you know, I, I can see their point. You, you know, the thing is with 1.7 HMR is it tends to blow things to pieces. And, you know, most of my rabbits are eaten, either eaten by me or by my uh, local falconry center. And that would, you know, it wouldn't be possible to do that with 1.7 HMR shot uh, rabbits. 2 to LR skips. Um, and at the end of the day, the main reason is that I like air guns. Um, no, I, you know, I'm not saying I dislike powder burners, but I like it. I shot air guns all my life, and you know, I like to sort of push it to the, the sort of the uh, almost as far as they'll go. So uh, yeah, but yeah, everything else, um, squirrels, rats, pigeons, is all sub twelve foot pound. But yeah, I like to use the big guns on the on the on the rabbits for longer distance. How about you, John? I, BSA obviously has some. FAC rated rifles, but probably best known for its sub twelve rifles. Do yeah. you get to shoot hmm. FAC air rifles? I, I I do have one. I have an R ten that's in FAC, um, and it, it's um, it's at, it's at, it's in two five. I think because I grew up, and probably ninety five percent of all of my shooting has been with um, you know sub twelve foot pounds. Hmm. I think that that's – I'm more comfortable with that. I know how to get in range. I enjoy the field craft of getting relatively in close to the rabbit. I think if there's a certain situation where I need a little bit more distance um, and don't uh, – you know, are unable to get too close. Um, but even then, I'm only t- the, the FAC is going to give me what 20 yards extra distance. I mean, I, I, I don't shoot at silly distances. You hear a lot of uh, talk in shooting community of, uh, mm. of, of longer distances than I, I think they individuals should be shooting at. So for me, it's only given me about 20 yards extra using the FAC. So I prefer to use um, mm. sub 12 foot pounds. Well, let, let me follow up then with another question. Um... This time from Tim Naylor, um, who has asked what the difference is between a spring rifle and a gas ram. Is there much difference between them, um, in particular, to the actual experience of shooting a gun? So, John, let me kick off with you first, because you're you know you, you make these things. So, why don't you talk us through the difference between gas ram and, and Springer, 
Um, basically, uh, if I start with your traditional spring brake barrel rifle, um, over time the spring will lose a little bit of its um, elasticity and it will lose a bit of its energy. Um, so there's one possible negative, although that's over quite a, a long, lengthy time yeah. period. Um, but also, when you break that barrel, when you break the gun open, and put your pellet in and close it. When you pull the trigger, that spring that you've compressed doesn't just go forward and stop, you know, shunting the pellet down the barrel. It twangs to and fro um, until it slowly comes to a stop. All the while it's doing that, that pellet's traveling down the barrel. And they're actually, even the, the steadiest hand will wobble to some degree with that. Um, I would say that with a gas ram rifle you get um it, it, it's a, it's the same cocking method but you're compressing um a, a gas ram that isn't too dissimilar to those that struts that are either side of your car boot and when one of those shoots forward it does stop so it still that gives recoil but it's one abrupt instead of ding 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 backwards and forwards that a spring would give um so therefore, for that reason, I would say that most shooters would shoot more accurately with a gas ramp than they would with a spring. Mm. There's other benefits of gas ramp because it is a little bit more expensive than uh, than, a, than a, a spring engine, if you if you like. Um, the um, the gas ramp also provides less abrasion, uh, metal on metal parts inside the gun, and it's also a sealed unit so that. When we do in our machine, say, a 3,000 shot test, the power level that the gun produces should be the same from the first to the end. Yeah. As with a spring, you'll see a power decrease in that time. So I think there are two main reasons, possibly three, that I would say I'd use to explain the difference, but also the benefits of a gas ram over spring. Yeah. Um, there's also um, it, it, it decreased lock time uh, on the gas ramp, um, which we measure from the second you pull the trigger, basically, to the time that the projectile exits the, the muzzle. Mm. Um, and that's uh, shorter with a gas ram than it is with a spring rifle, mm. Mm. Um, allowing less time for the pellet to travel down the barrel for you to wobble mm. and uh, send the projectile off target. <laughs> so, um, yeah. But you have got, you know, it might all be about budget. And once you get used to both, you'll shoot fantastically well with both. So budget-wise, the spring rifle will probably be mm. 40 to 60 quid cheaper than the gas ram equivalent of the same model, mm. if you get me. Gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> How about you, Matt? Much experience of shooting gas rams? Not a, not a lot. Um, I, one thing I would say is, They've definitely improved. I can remember my first experience, and also it was probably down to a lack of familiarity, but um, this is a long time ago now. It must have been about 25 years ago, maybe more. A friend got a Theoban Sirocco, which yeah. I couldn't wait to get my hands on and have a go with it because I'd read so much about these amazing gas ram air guns. And my first experience of it was... Even this, you know, hallowed name, the Theoban brand, which was massive at the time, it was so harsh. It was fast. It was very, you could, you could tell the lock time was, was swift. It, it Relative to the, the soggy springers that I was accustomed to, it seemed like the pellet was hitting the target almost before I pulled the trigger. But it felt very snappy. I thought my fillings were going to fall out. And I was actually sort of quite happy <laughs> to get back onto a spring gun. Um, but yeah, it's, it was a different shooting experience. And in fact, even the less expensive gas rams now, I think, are actually smoother than those earlier the opens were. So the technology's come, come a long way. And, and yes, mm. it was certainly faster. What about you, Rich? Mm. That's interesting because I've, I've got a the open Sirocco. Um, and following off the last question, it's an 18 foot pound FAC. And they've also got a 26 foot pound um, el eliminator. And right. the, the Sirocco gets a bit of use, getting used to, but is I, I love shooting it. The, the Eliminator is enormous. It's longer than a test match. It's huge. And it 
real take your teeth out every single shot. Accurate, but you just had to sort of hang on and hope that you're still sitting down once you pull the trigger. And I think it, it seems to me, and I think your point, John, about price is a good one because I think budget um, gas rams, you know, my experience, the vast majority are just hateful things. You know, they've probably been made super cheap to still be budget when there's obviously more manufacturing money in there than it is to make a cheap springer. Um, and then I think yeah, there, there's there's a big jump then up into up to the uh, you know the the Lightning G the GRT Lightning and the HW90 I think it is a Virar at the top there, and there's a big gulf then down to the sort of the the cheap and nasties. But um, I think everyone should have one because I think it's a it's a different you know I think a lot of people nowadays shoot a Springer because they are they want something that's a little bit more challenging and involved in shooting a PCP, and if that's you, then shooting a gas ram is an extension of that kind of self challenge. I think. But those are all the questions I had. I had Matt. Do you have any at all from from viewers? Yeah. Um... I've I've got a slightly contentious one. We I think we we struck a bit of a nerve last time we were on. Uh, I won't put names to it, but we picked up on the subject of shooting rabbits during the springtime. When, as we mm -hmm. had pointed out to us, that's likely to be their breeding season, and the question was raised as to whether we should or shouldn't be doing that. I'm, I'm going to jump in very quickly and say. I have permissions where I shoot the odd rabbit for the pot. The landowner isn't desperate to have them eradicated. Some of those permissions have been hit quite hard by the hemorrhagic virus, and I've been leaving off of those permissions, certainly during the breeding season, because the rabbits there aren't there in the numbers that they used to be. So giving them a chance to bounce back. However, the majority of the rabbit shooting that I do, and I'm sure it's the same for you, Rich, is pony paddocks, horse paddocks, where the owners are desperate to stop rabbits from digging burrows that a horse or pony can put its leg down, break its leg. An expensive vet's bill is, is, is the result. If not, you know, worst case scenario, the animal might have to be destroyed. Now, if you set the, mm. that in the concept, context of that happening to somebody's pet dog, it would be unthinkable to ignore that problem. And I, I couldn't say to a landowner, I'm terribly sorry, but it doesn't really seem ethical to me to shoot the rabbits at the moment when they're breeding while you've got mm -hmm. 15 or 20. Let me come back in the autumn when you've got 150 or 200 and I'll feel better about myself and shoot them then when they're fully grown. So looking at it from a practical pest control point of view, I just can't see that there is an argument for, for, for leaving off and calling a truce because there may be young underground, does may be carrying young. It's not particularly tasteful, but that's the fact as far as I'm concerned. And also you're going to start, do you want to apply these same rules? If you had to apply those rules to rabbit control, I would say it'd be logical to apply them to gray squirrel control and rat control. If, if you're talking about mm -hmm. warm-blooded mammals with similar intelligence, they probably deserve similar rights. I couldn't entertain the idea of leaving off of rat shooting and gray squirrel control because there's a risk of them it being their breeding season uh, or, or them having having young that unfortunately, and it is unfortunate, but you know they, they perish as a result of, of that pest control. I, I can't I can't call a truce because it's that that time of year. Um, that's my take on it. Anything to add, Rich? Yeah, I'm very similar, Matt. I mean, um, I think, um, like you, if, if I'm shooting rabbits on a permission where they're not being pests, you know, they are, you know, food, then, yeah, I'll, I'll try and, you know, as best I can, either not shoot at all or I'll, I'll try and pick out the bucks. You know, you can see sort of tattered ears and things like that. Um, but, you know, largely I'll, I'll kind of leave them alone um, because I'm blessed with enough shooting elsewhere. And yeah, like you, I mean, you know, there's a big difference between hunting and ethical hunting and pest control. Um, and like you, I shoot a lot of, of, of uh, horse paddocks, pony paddocks, um, where I've had owners of, of lost horses and, and ponies because of, of, of injury. 
And I also shoot a lot on, uh, on a commercial farm, a fruit farm, where the rabbits chew through. I mean, you know, they eat um, the plants, and you know, that's an obvious problem. They co- cost money that way. But they also chew through the irrigation pipes. And the whole place is, is laid out so carefully um, to get and allocated the right, scientifically worked out, right amount of water um, for the crop to grow that by chewing through an irrigation pipe, they also affect the water pressure. The water delivery gets um, is lessened in a part of the farm and the crop goes down. So it's a real problem from, for, for the farm you know, from a pound, shilling and pence perspective. So like you, if I said, look, I'm not going to shoot, you know, the, the, the rabbits because they might be in season, you know, they might be with, with young or whatever, then I wouldn't have that permission anymore, you know? And, and yes, I don't like the thought of it, but I'm there to do a job at the end of the day. And if I have a job to do, then, then I owe it to, to myself and to my permission owners to do it. But, you know, if I don't have a job, then yeah, I'm quite happy to leave them alone this time of year. John, any, anything to add to that one? I'm completely agreeing with um, both your explanations there. Um, from my side, um, yeah, I never go out to wipe out the population of uh, of, of rabbits or grey squirrels um, that I happen to be, you know, be, be invited in to kind of pest control. I mean, the, the fields that I'm going on at the weekend where I said there's three private football pitches, they're all different age groups and sizes that play on the three pitches and they don't like getting twisted ankles or shall we say, you know, could be even worse. Mm. So, um, no, the numbers just need thinning out. Otherwise, they just get out of control. Um, but I would shoot at this time of the year. Um, and just reduce the numbers for exactly the same reasons that you've both just explained. Well, 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 one thing I would add to that is I probably would shoot the last grey squirrel. I, I, I wouldn't have any compunction. I think a lot of <laughs> landowners would, would thank me for that because, because it's an introduced species, because of the damage it does. Anyhow, move, moving on, um, what I think is a much more straightforward, less, less emotive question. A uh, question from Ian Stevens. Ian Stevens has got a very lucky 10-year-old son. Ian would like to buy him an air gun to shoot under his supervision uh, supervision in the garden. Ooh. And his question is, should he buy his son an air rifle that fits him now? Or should he buy what I would describe as an adult-sized air rifle and wait for him to grow into it? John, this is probably a good one for you. <laughs> Well, oh, good question. Well, of course, he should buy a BSA JSR, uh, Ultra JSR, um, specifically designed for 10-year-olds. Um, it, it initially, it was actually modelled on a 10-year-old who shouldered it and uh, led to the design of the stock. Um, it is a good question. Um, I think that fit and feeling comfortable enables you to shoot better, regardless of your age. So, therefore, I would start them off with something that's uh, more befitting to them and maybe lighter as well and something that they feel comfortable with. And then once they get to grips with that and begin to shoot well, you can then think about the future and buying a large model. I think the last thing you want to do is give them give them a, a, what could be a, you know, a, a large plank for them to start shooting with and them not have a – great greatest experience and then uh you know not persevere so uh yeah get something that fits is my recommendation yeah i i wrote a, a feature for the magazine a few years back about guns for children and um got four or five guns together and they're obviously all small guns but and the jsr was one of them and at, at the end of the day i said well which one do you like the most and they all like the jsr the most you know because it was just made for them it wasn't just a little gun it was made for them and so i would say yeah the the jsi is definitely worth considering there are also some um sort of adult size rifles that have telescopic stocks that you can actually make quite short as well um so i help run a club on a saturday and we have some some you know, probably nine ten eleven eleven year olds come up and we've got a couple of rifles that have fold uh, have um sliding stocks which we can push right in and you know with a scope set back they can use quite comfortably uh, but i think yeah I, I mean probably the worst solution 
is to buy a big adult size gun and have a little chap struggle to to align with it, hold it, cock it, see through it. You know, it's going to put him off quickly, I think. Yeah, I, I would say the same thing. I mean, it, it's about making those early experiences positive, isn't it? Um, mm. I, I was probably so enthusiastic that I would have fallen off the end of a blunderbuss and it wouldn't have discouraged me. But I think for, for some children, if you, if you want to nurture that interest, they've got, they've got to feel like they're capable, they're competent. It's not incredibly difficult. They're not mm. wrestling with the gun. And mo- most importantly of all, they are hitting the target. And if the gun fits them, from from the get go, it's going to be a happier experience, and hopefully more more targets are going to get knocked down. V- exactly. Very quickly before we wrap up, John, I don't I don't know if you're expecting this, but it's a question that Rich and I probably wouldn't want to have to answer. But you're stuck on a desert island. You're allowed one air gun on your desert island. You may have alluded to what this might be earlier on, actually, when you're talking about hunting. But one desert island air gun. You, you can have a compressor on the island if you need one, but uh, what, what will, would your desert island air gun be? I grew up with um, a BSA Super Sport in 177, and I felt that I could not miss with it. When I actually joined BSA um, to work for them 19 years ago, I brought it in for a bit of a clean-up and to put under the eyes of somebody who knew more about uh, the inner workings of them and and and, and had the know how, and he laughed at me because the barrel was partly bent, it was rusty, and the stock looked a bit battered, but I I, I couldn't miss with it, and um, I think that would be the one that I'd put in. Um, again, with my BSA head on, I'd probably say you know one of my my R10 or the R12, which I love as well, and they shoot beautifully well, but I think from uh, just that childhood experience that got me hooked on shooting full stop, not just air gunning, but shooting would be that BSA Super Sport. Good choice. Good choice. Nice. Well, I want to, to wrap up by reminding everybody to grab a copy of Air Gun World magazine, or better still, to take out a subscription, get it delivered to your door. Now, you can find out about subscription details at airgunshooting.co.uk, and we will put a link into the show description. There is also an offer there for people who tune in for the podcast. Uh, thanks again to Crackshot for sponsoring this podcast. Rich, thanks for your time. John, thank you ever so much for joining us. Dave and Terry will be back again with another podcast in a fortnight. Rich and I will be back two weeks after that. Thank you for tuning in. Mm-hmm.